Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So may I now request our uh, Madam Asha Mukherjee to introduce our next speaker, Benny Mayer, for his uh, speech. Ma'am, please. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Gail Presby. Um, it has been truly illuminating, and especially the the, the women's contribution in uh, sort of making Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, and especially the non-violence kind of uh, 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 inspirations which he got from the women of South Africa. I think that was extremely encouraging and enriching for all of us. Uh, I think uh, uh, Bra Bra uh, uh, Bra Bernie has not joined as yet. Uh, can I? Uh, is Bernie there? Hello? Hello. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we can wait for him. Uh, it seems that see the the time difference is really a kind of uh, problem. Uh, we are working in three time zones, and perhaps that might have created some uh, confusion. But uh, I don't see that uh, Bernie has joined yet. So what we can do is perhaps uh, maybe. We can introduce him by the time he comes. Uh, yeah, perhaps we can introduce him and see uh, when he comes. Uh, I hope he joins within five to seven minutes. Um, there's a difference of uh, time zone. We are working right now with three time zones. Uh, uh, it, it was early 5 a.m. at his place. So I hope he will join soon. Uh, let me introduce our next speaker, who is supposed to be the key speaker, Bernie Meyer. He is basically a peace activist uh, known as American Gandhi. Uh, he is a longtime peace activist. Bernie Meyer dressed in a traditional dhoti. Uh, perhaps when he comes, you will see him in his traditional Dhoti, literally like a American uh, uh, Gandhi, uh, with walking stick, brings you the leg legendary Mahatma Gandhi. As Gandhi, he was traveled throughout the United States. He has traveled uh, throughout the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, as well as India, where he has been lovingly dubbed as the American Gandhi. Uh, his uh, memoir, The American Gandhi, which is published some time back. Uh, he has lived through an experience, some, uh, 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 he has lived through ex an experience, some of the most formative times and events of American nation. And this collection of autobiographical essay deserves a wide reading audience. These are the comments which we have received about his book, The American Gandhi. Uh, and uh, it's a but Bernie Meyer writes with compelling clarity and authenticity about his experiences as a practitioner of nonviolence. His story, story beautifully intervened, intertwined with that of his mentors, especially Gandhi, becomes a guidebook for our lives as we inevitably face choices between chaos and community, between nonviolence and non existence. These are some of the comments on the book. For 40 years, Meyer has been and done. Uh, has seen and done it all to America's movements of peace and justice. Activists have come and gone, but Meyer has stayed, and the knowledge he has gained is invaluable for everyone hoping to achieve positive changes in the 21st century. Uh, during his presentation, Brown, Bernie weaves through, weaves together Gandhi's messages regarding human dignity, spirituality, politics, economics, community, world peace, faith, interdependence, forgiveness, and much more. Uh, Bernie has led salt walks in the USA and taken Gandhi presence to the highways and byways. In India, Bernie speaks as Gandhi. So we are really looking forward for joining, uh, joining him uh, as Gandhi and um, 
maybe we can wait for 5 to 10 minutes i will apologize to my audience uh, we might have to wait 5 to 10 minutes it seems there is some uh, uh sir yes? yes i've i've just received an email yeah from him he needed the connect the the link resent i just resent it and i'm also trying to call him on his home phone so that he realizes i sent oh. him the link Okay, okay. So, so we'll, I'll be, I'm working yeah. on it. Okay, thank you so much, Gail. Thank you so much. Yeah, so we'll wait for five minutes to join him. Yeah. Yeah, we'll just wait. Okay, starting now. Namaskar. I thank Visva. Bharata for having me on for this important Gandhi message in 2020. The end is in the beginning. The end is our beginning. The end when Gandhi in 1946 got out of prison and prepared the people and the government for independence from the United Kingdom. In 1946, the Congress Committee, which Gandhi had worked with for years, did not accept his desire that India and Pakistan not be divided, that it remain one country. He talked to the National Committee, the Congress. He talked with the uh, Muslim League, with Jinnah as its head, many times, trying to convince him not to break off Pakistan from India. And Lord Mountbatten, who had been sent by the United Kingdom to prepare for India's independence, also denied him what he was requesting. So Gandhi chose to leave Delhi in these conversations and to go to stop the killing in the Bengal. Muslims were being killed by 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 the Hindus and the Hindus were being killed by the Muslims. Gandhi left for Bengal and Calcutta. August 15th came, 1947. Independence came and India was divided with Pakistan and Gandhi did not celebrate independence. He said, I must test my methods of nonviolence by stopping the killing. Do or die was his theme, walking from village to village. As they walked were the, into the villages in Bengal, and Noah Kali. Gandhi sang the words of Tagore in his poem, Walk Alone. If they turn away and do not listen, walk alone. If they turn away and face the wall, mutely standing. O thou of evil luck, open out thy mind and speak alone. If they do not accompany you when crossing the wilderness, O thou of evil luck, trample the thorn under thy tread along bloodline track 
travel alone. If they do not hold out the lamp when the night is troubled with storm, O thou of evil luck, with the thunder flame of pain, ignite thine own heart and let it burn alone. At this time, to stop the killing in Calcutta, Gandhi fasted to the death, ready to die to stop the killing. And the leaders of the Muslims and the Hindus met him and pledged to stop the killing. When the killings died down, Gandhi left for the Punjab to stop the killing there. On the way to the Punjab, he stopped in Delhi. And again, in Delhi, he had to fast to the death in January 1948 to stop the killing in Delhi. And again, the leaders came and pledged to end the killing in Delhi. On January 29th, 1948, Margaret Burke White, Life magazine journalist, asked Gandhi, what about the atom bomb and nonviolence? And Gandhi replied, Nonviolence is the only thing that the atom bomb cannot harm. I did not move a muscle when I heard of the bombing of Hiroshima. I said to myself, the nonviolence is the only thing that the atom bomb cannot harm. If humanity does not end the atom bomb, it will be suicide for mankind. The next day, January 30, 1948, Gandhi met his assassin with forgiveness in his heart and Ram on his lips. This end is key to what I want to say today. There's two basic ideas and realities in Gandhi's last words to Margaret Burke White. The first one is nonviolence is the only thing the atom bomb cannot harm. The second is unless humanity is the atom bomb, it will be su certain suicide for mankind. These two ideas, I want to draw out the meaning and implications in this discussion we have today. These two ideas go deep into the realities of life on earth into the realities of human meaning and human activity. These are the two things I'm focusing on in this discussion. Our world today, 2020, we have a nuclear arms world, nine countries with nuclear weapons, I've been resisting nuclear weapons since 1974. On August 10th of this year, two weeks ago, we had a demonstration at Subbase Bangor. This is us in the United States where I live, at Naval Kissap Subbase.
blocking the road to the base to say, end nuclear weapons, abolish nuclear weapons. It's the 75th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This flyer says 75 years after atom uranium bomb on Hiroshima and plutonium bomb on Nagasaki. Blocking the way to Kisses Subbase Bangor for first strike trident bombs. The nuclear weapons on one trident submarine produce, can produce an explosive power 5,000 times more than the bomb on Hiroshima. This is our statement by blocking the road, risking arrest by Ground Zero Center for Nonviolent Action, a group I've been working with since 1978, arrested many times blocking this road. We say, on the 75th anniversary of the genocidal devastation of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and in a time of universal upheaval brought on by racial injustice, climate crisis, global pandemic, we view the nuclear weapons housed at Naval Base Kitsap as the ultimate existential danger of our time. Nuclear weapons are the knee on the neck of all people of the globe, choking the life out of the planet. Any order to launch nuclear weapons would be illegal under international law. We appeal to military personnel to stand down and to refuse all such orders. We appeal to all our fellow citizens to demand abolition of all nuclear weapons and to redirect the colossal ex expenditure of resources to meet human needs. So that's part of my message here. A friend of mine yesterday sent me this link to a TED talk about nuclear weapons. It starts with the dinosaur extinction and goes to what it means for nuclear weapons to be used, creating a nuclear nightmare. It mentions India and Pakistan having a nuclear war, which could cause one to two billion people to die. Secondly, we have fires, huge forest fires in many places in the world. We have flooding. We have record storms, all caused by the climate disruption. Get this, for the last 30 days, all-time high temperatures outnumbered the record cold, 86 to 0. <coughs> Year to date, record highs were 212 to E11 record lows. There was a time not too long ago when record highs were similar in number to record low. On August 16th, California's Death Valley had the hottest ever recorded temperature, 129.9 degrees Fahrenheit. The hottest ever recorded. Asia, Japan, combining heat and humidity. China, 
Bangladesh experiencing floods like Karachi right now at this time. These are human caused events. Human caused. The humans made nuclear weapons and the humans are sending up CO2 and pollutants in the atmosphere causing climate to change. My presentation to you is from the crisis, an essay I wrote a year ago before coming to India. I spent six months before coming to India last September writing this essay. This essay pulls together ideas and learning I have gotten going back to 1958 when I became a Catholic priest. 1969, I was arrested by the Dow Chemical Company in Washington, D.C. to stop the war in Vietnam. Before doing that, I challenged the church and got arrested by the Catholic Church where I was a priest ordained in 1965. We challenged the church to do more, to say more about the war in Vietnam about racism against black people and about poverty that exists in America. This is my life. So this crisis magazine or an essay is an extensive document. I will not be able to adequately cover. That's okay. I cannot cover this whole thing. It's too much. It's taken me years and decades to come to the understandings here. But I would encourage you to reflect on these matters, to go into the depth of what is going on on planet Earth at this time. I start with a quote from Robert J. Lifton, a psychiatrist from The Broken Connection. We may recall Heinrich Boll's dictum of the artist carrying death within him, like the good priest his bravery. Now we must carry not just death, as he always did, but a particular set of images of the end of the world. While death has always served as a constitutive symbol, can we say the same of an image of a technologically induced end of the world? Technologically induced end of the world, meaning human created technology? Can the artist create from that image can the rest of us continue our form making and transcend our suicide constructs in the face of that pervasive suggestion of the end of everything? This book revolves around that question. Robert J. Lifton's The Broken Connection is his magnus opus. He was a psychiatrist and he started by interviewing the victims of the atom bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, not just the victims, but also the victimizers. The second beginning is a quote from Thomas Merton, a monk, one of my teachers through his writing from 1958. This quote, realization of the supreme player whose play is manifested in the million formed inexhaustible richness of beings and events is what gives us the key to the meaning of life. Once we live in awareness of the comic dance, cosmic dance, and move in time with the dancer, our life attains its 
true dimension. Merton, like the Gita, goes to the deepest within us, to the truth within us, to the goodness within us. And humanity is postured at this time with the possibility of total destruction of human life. Merton, my favorite author on Gandhi's life, raises the question, quoting Ananda Kumarasamy, East and West are at cross purposes only because of the West being determined and once resolved and eco economically determined to keep on going it knows not where. And it calls the rudderless village progress. In Visakhapatnam last October, I went to a conference on space, pointing that technology we are creating is going to space. And the United States President Trump just created a space space mission mission. So Mayor Burton died in 68. It's 2020 now. His idea goes through. There's three sections to this book. First, nuclearism, described by Robert J. Lefton. The second, about human insights in human failure to foresee the implications of human decisions and actions. The third, the wisdom that existed from time successful to survivors of crisis. Gandhi penetrates the core reality of Ernest Becker's findings as to human motivation. The insights or wisdom is limited due to the incomplete evolving of human consciousness. I skip through this book and I go to Robert J. Lipton's definition of nu nuclearism. He says, the ultimate contemporary deformation of one's self-conscious self-image is a condition we may call nuclearism. The passionate embrace of nuclear weapons as a solution to death anxiety, a way to restoring a lost sense of immortality. Nuclearism is a secular religion, a total ideology in which grace and even salvation, the mastery of death and evil, are achieved through the power of a new technological deity. The deity is seen as capable not only of apocalyptic destruction, but also of unlimited creation. The nuclear believer or nuclearist allies himself with that power and feels compelled to expound on the virtues of his deity. He may come to depend on the weapon to keep the world going. The idea here is that for power and strength to control and dominate the nuclear bomb is a tool that we are one with and gives us that power. There's much to say about this here, but Lifton points out to the father of the hydrogen bomb, Edward Teller, is a prime example of nuclearism. 
Teller and others thus associated the creation of the hydrogen bomb, which more than a smaller atomic bomb raises the specter of human annihilation. As an expression of faith in human exploration and in the spirit of the Enlightenment, Lifted quotes Lift Teller, we would be unfaithful to the tradition of Western civilization if we shied away from exploring what man can accomplish, if we failed to increase man's control over nature. The duty of scientists specifically is to explore and explain. This duty led to the invention of the principle that made the hydrogen bomb a practical reality. From 1953 on, the U.S. has been racing to keep ahead and dominate the world by nuclear weapons. Lifton says Teller made one of the most remarkable statements of nuclearism about the fallout scare. Teller said radiation from the test fallout is very small. Its effect on human beings is so little that if it exists at all, it cannot be measured. Radiation from test fallout might be slightly harmful to humans. It might be slightly beneficial. It might have no effect at all. So, that's the idea of nuclearism. There's much more to say about it. Robert Oppenheimer, who led the development of the atom bomb for the United States, during World War II, quotes the Bhagavad Gita, Gandhi's own Bible. If the radius of a thousand suns were to burst at once into the sky, that would be like the splendor of the mighty one. I am become death, the shatterer of worlds. He later regretted the use of the atom bomb. I move now to the principles of Gandhi as explained by Thomas Merton. But before doing that, I want to quote Merton on the bomb. It's related in similar ways to that of Lifton, Robert J. Lifton. Burton says, the great sin, the source of all other sins, is idolatry. Never has it been greater, more prevalent than now. It is almost completely unrecognized precisely because it is so overwhelmingly total. It takes in everything. There is nothing else left. Fetishism and power. The bomb is only one accidental aspect of the cult. The cult, like Lifton's idea of the bomb. Indeed, the bomb is not the worst. We should be thankful for it as a sign, a revelation of what all the rest of our civilization points to, the self-immolation of man to his own greed, his own despair. Behind it all are the principalities and powers whom man serves in his idolatry and Christians are as involved in this as everyone else. Burton sums up Gandhi's idea of the Gita. 
the perspective of East and West. If the Gita brings to the West salutary reminder that our highly activistic and one-sided culture is faced with a crisis that may end in self-destruction because it lacks inner death of authentic metaphysical consciousness. Without such depth, our moral and political protestations are just as much verbiage. If the West, if in the West, God can no longer be experienced other than dead, it is because of an inner split and self-alienation which have characterized the Western mind, the idea of image, of liftings. In a single-minded dedication to only half of life, to that which is exterior, objective, and quantitative, the death of God and the consequent death of genuine moral sense, respect for life, for humanity, for value, has expressed the death, the death of an inner subjective quality of life, a quality which is the traditional religious, in traditional religions, experienced in terms of God consciousness. Not concentration on an idea or concept of God, still left less as an image of God, but a sense of presence, a sense of presence of an ultimate ground of reality and meaning from which life and love could spontaneously flower. Our whole lifestyle revolves around these concepts, our whole way of life. I moved to Gandhi and Gandhi's simple staying expressed in a book, The Real Gandhi, by Siddhaswar Prasad. I quote just a short part of it, but it gets to the very core of what Gandhi believed. Gandhi says, I fixed out upon one mantra that I am going to recite to you as containing the whole essence of Hinduism. I have come to the final conclusion that if all the Upanishads and all the other scriptures happened all of a sudden to be reduced to ashes, and if only one first, if only the first verse of the Ishopanishad were left intact in the memory of Hindus, Hinduism would live forever. All other mantras of that ancient Upanishad are a commentary or an attempt to give us the full meaning of the first mantra. As I read the mantra in light of the Gita, or the Gita in light of the mantra, I find that the Gita is a commentary on this mantra. Gandhi goes further. It seems to me to satisfy the cravings of socialist and communist, of the philosopher and the economist, I venture to suggest to all who are, who, all who do not belong to the Hindu faith, that it satisfies their cravings too. And it is true, and I hold it to be true. You do not take anything in Hinduism which is inconsistent with or contrary to the meaning of this mantra. One translation of the mantra into English says, all this whatsoever that means moves in this moving universe is encompassed by the self. 
self written with a capital S, meaning the ultimate truth, the ultimate reality, God in some people's language. When thou hast surrendered all that life, all, for example, material wealth, and will seek not what others continue to possess, then thou mayest truly enjoy. So, this needs to be spelled out, laid out, much more. Much more. And these pages go into it. And outlined from many sources. Many sources. And I conclude, after skipping through much, you know, before concluding, I have to end with a question that the author of these ideas on the real Gandhi, S O S, have post Gandhi Indians cared for their formidable obligation both to Gandhi G and to history. Think about that. Think about that. To answer that question, we must know Gandhi. So I conclude this presentation quoting Merton. In conclusion, Gandhi's vow of truth and all the other ashram vows, which were the necessary preamble, preamble to the awakening of mature political consciousness, must be seen for what they are, not simply ascetic or devotional indulgences that may possibly suit the fancy of a few religious pacifists and confused poets, but precepts fundamentally necessary if man is to recover his right mind. Going back to those two parts to the original statement by Gandhi to Margaret Burke White. This essay, The Crisis, comes to this point identifying the two. Our own right mind. What does that mean? What does that take? How do we go about it? That's what I want to leave you with. I could bring much more to you, uh, but this is what I was asked to do. Again, thank you. Thank you for having me here and giving this brief presentation. I wish you peace, love, and truth. In the words of Gandhi Satyagraha, Truth, reality, that which is. Ahimsa, the way of love and nonviolence. Tapasha, exerting all one's energies, even giving one's life if necessary, to attain and live by truth and love. Namaskar. With your kind permission, we have one question for Dr. Sanjay Lal. Maybe check whether he is in the floor, then we can take up the question and answer. Dr. Lal, you around? Hello. Dr. 
Dr. Sanjay Lal, are you in the floor? Yes, he is. Ah, he's still there. Hello. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I just. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, we do have some time, so maybe we can yeah. take up some one or two questions for you. Dr. Okay, Lal, sure. Yeah. 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 Actually, sir, we have received one question for you. That mm -hmm. a religion and Gandhi's religion, how we will match both in modern world? What do you think, sir? Uh, well, I, I think, uh, and I, I try to uh, flesh this out more in, in the book, uh, that if we if we pay particular attention to uh, uh, inclusion of religion in uh, the education curriculum, uh, that that um, governments uh, yeah. incorporate, yeah. and also uh, in including. Uh, religious identity in, in attempts to foster uh, multiculturalism, uh, then, then much promising work uh, can be done in advancing a, a, a Gandhian understanding of uh, religion and of uh, religion's place in public life. Uh, I, I think if, um, for instance, uh, children are uh, taught to uh, study uh, other religions from uh, a very sympathetic perspective, what like Gandhi articulated, and uh, we we taught about the great moral exemplars from all the different uh, faith traditions that can be found. Uh, that 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 would be one concrete way in which um, the the ideals that that I see Gandhi to espouse can be can be better achieved. Yeah, uh, I mean in. in modern times, certainly there, there's a lot that um, has to be taken into consideration, uh, you know, given, given our uh, constraints, given, given the realities, but I still think that uh, Gandhi's uh, proposals are, are very uh, viable uh, for our age. Thank you. Then, uh, sir, I have one question for you. How actually, how would you like to, yeah, see how uh, in the current scenario of uh, India, how do you think that India and uh, Gandhian philosophy is applicable? Uh, yeah, that, that uh, for me is a challenging question. Uh, I uh, have uh, been living and writing just about my entire life in, in the West, but uh, it, it seems to me that uh, you know p part of the answer uh, may lie in kind of adopting uh, uh, the, the mindset that I think was prevalent among um, uh, political leaders uh, in India during Gandhi's time, where uh, secularism had this meaning that uh, all the great uh, religions would be would be accommodated and would be uh, promoted, not any um, uh, one religion over others, uh, didn't mean that there would be uh, government uh, separation from, from religion. Uh, I, I know uh, in India, there, there's so much going on with us and and uh, I, I'm hesitant to uh, talk beyond that given my, my limited uh, experience uh, in India, but uh, it would seem like uh, also moving away from the, the literalist kind of understanding of truth, but like I, I think Gandhi advocates for all of us to do would be, would be good for, for Indian society in regards to uh, how religion is handled. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Then, uh, one more question for uh, Madam uh, Jell, uh, since uh, you are in the floor. Uh, Madam, one question for you. How can we see the basic thoughts of Gandhian philosophy among all the children from their early days? It is very important in this violent world. Please comment. So it's asking how we can start with children and bring the nonviolent message to children. Uh, I, I think that's, that's a very good uh, point. 
the, the way we raise them, the values we impart to them. I have to say, I've met some people on my travel, Cindy, I've met some people who said, I was on the salt march. I spent years in jail as an infant because their parents had uh, been part of the 1930 salt march and it took, and the mother took her baby with her into the jail. So that's starting really early with examples of nonviolent uh, protest. But of course, there's so many ways we practice nonviolence in our families. And, um, and in our in our schools, and as well as when we get to the point of nonviolent civil disobedience. But I do know some uh, peace peace activist families here in the U.S., and they have children who grew up and are as dedicated to nonviolent action as their parents were. Uh, for example, uh, Phil Berrigan and Liz McAllister, their daughter, Frida Berrigan, is a very big uh, uh, activist against uh, uh, nuclear weapons, nuclear proliferation. And uh, she's also been involved in protesting the imprisonment of people in Guantanamo Bay. Those are just some of our issues here. We have uh, activists who raise their children in that way. Every so often an activist says, my son is joining the, you know, the military. I don't know why, you know. Uh, parents and children don't always uh, uh, follow each other's footsteps, but this is where we need a wider community. We need the influence of the grandparents, not just the parents. Sometimes the parents aren't the best influence. And we need uh, social promotion, uh, through education, et cetera, of nonviolent principles as well as techniques which can be learned in the grade schools. We have some programs here about how to nonviolently de-escalate a conflict in the schools. Thank you, ma'am. So, thank you. Yeah. Uh, one more question for you. I'm not leaving you. <laughs> one more question. So does nonviolence influence women's participation in the movement against suppression of their rights or otherwise? Does nonviolence influence women's participation in the movement against suppression of uh, their rights or otherwise? Please comment. Well, I mean, we have so many women's movements in many ways. Women have taken the leadership in nonviolent movements. You had the women of uh, Liberia who, uh, Lema Bowie and others, who uh, stopped a longstanding uh, warfare in their country using nonviolent action. And uh, here, right now, we have Black Lives Matter movement, which was founded by three women who uh, advocate not only women's rights, but an end to racism. And they also advocate uh, religious pluralism and harmony between peoples. And as you know, our country is filled now with uh, Black Lives Matter protests. Now, I don't know what the media coverage is like it in India, but around here, we know that the vast majority of these protests are peaceful. And we have uh, protesters like uh, sports uh, players, both men and women, taking a knee in their protests, which is a nonviolent action. But sometimes I can't say that there's never any violence that breaks out. And sometimes uh, certain newspapers, they only want to report on the violence because they mm -hmm. want to discredit these movements. But they are majority nonviolent movements. And so, uh, and women are leading them. So all around the world, I think women are taking these leadership roles. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Lalsar, one more question for you, Dr. Sanjay Lalsar. Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, what curriculums should be included in the study sessions of children to make them actively practice Gandhian philosophy in this world or in the contemporary world? 
Uh, yeah, that, that, that's a, a good question. Uh, I would again uh, emphasize uh, those uh, aspects within a, a religious curriculum uh, of the uh, religions practitioners and religions uh, teachings that uh, all of us should, should be able to uh, uh, endorsed and uh, be inspired by. Uh, I, I include uh, in, in the book a uh, part of Gandhi's uh, correspondence with Ambedkar where uh, Ambedkar uh, criticizes uh, what he sees as the, the superstitions uh, in, in Hinduism and, and Gandhi is uh, readily admitting that side of Hinduism but then he, he, he talks about th this other side that he says any, any conscience should be able to accept. Uh, I think in all the great religions, we have that, that side uh, that, that, that should be what, what's emphasized in any kind of uh, public education curriculum. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your nice and briefing, uh, highlighting on the questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you. So ma'am, can we check whether our next speaker but the mayor has joined. Gail, do you have any news? Um, the news is I have sent him the link twice and I called him on phone twice and I left the phone message. I am just hoping that he okay. either listens to his phone or notices the link in his email, but I don't have any other update. Okay. So if you might have to wait, I think he's try, trying. It seems that he sent a mail saying that he doesn't have the link, but I don't know what happened. Uh, we have just uh, sent the meeting ID and uh, passport to Bernie Mayer's email ID, yahoo.com. Okay. Good. So, so we apologize to the audience. We might have to wait for a while again. Yeah. He's comfortable with Zoom and that was one of the reasons that we sort of <laughs> did everything to make him, to accommodate him so that he, he will be comfortable with Zoom. <coughs> and uh, he's a very, one of the most prestigious speaker for our webinars. So we, I will request all of our audience to please wait for some time. Just be patient for some time. Okay. If anybody has questions, maybe we can take some more questions. Yeah, we have uh, two more questions. Uh, one question for Madam Gill. What are the Gandhi's principles of nonviolence? Madam Gill, please, for you one question. What are Gandhi's Principles of nonviolence. Um, it's 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 a big topic, I guess. I'm trying to think how to uh, summarize it, but uh, some of the ideas behind Gandhi's uh, commitment to nonviolence have to do with his insistence. And some have said he, he got these ideas from uh, Jainism that no one of us has the entire truth. And in acknowledging that no one of us has the entire truth, we therefore uh, need to, we still need to express ourselves and we still need to live out the truth that we know, but realizing our possible error, we should live it out in a way that we do not harm others. So I can't say, I know I'm right and you're wrong and therefore I will harm you. I can try to let you know what I think is right. I can try to hold uh, onto my, uh, my uh, view and let you know about it and live out my view, but I will not harm you while I do that. 
And maybe Sanjay Lal has something to add to this topic too. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then one more uh, related question for you. What's the name of Gandhi's idea of nonviolent resistance? Gandhi's idea of nonviolent resistance. Okay. Yeah. Because nonviolence itself is the broader topic. It can cover, you know, non, uh, everything, nonviolent speech, uh, nonviolent eating, etc. But nonviolent resistance is a campaign. Yes. And a uh, campaign that, um, and there are steps to these campaigns. And actually, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. learned a lot from Gandhi Satyagraha to realize there are steps to a campaign. There is first a fact finding mission. Is there an injustice going on? If so, what is it? And then there is exploring the um, possible resolution short of nonviolent resistance. Like, can you go to the parties? Can you get them to reconcile? Can you get the politicians to you know, change the rules, et cetera? If they don't do that on their own, then the next thing you do is you announce that you are going to have a campaign of nonviolent resistance. And then you train your satyagrahis, the people who are going to participate in your campaign, you train in advance on how you are going to um, resist this um, uh, uh, and whether it's going to involve civil disobedience, whether it's going to involve non-payment of taxes, because Gandhi used several different, uh, several different methods. So you train, and then you engage in it. And you engage in it as a concerted action. And you work together, and then it's important to uh, not to give in when those forces of violence are aimed against you. And this could mean you would end up in jail. Uh, as we saw, even some of the people in the, in the Gandhi 1913 campaign died in jail or soon after being jailed because of their uh, illnesses in jail. So it does take a lot of dedication and uh, during the time when the pressure was being put on, for example, the government of South Africa or a government of India or local governments of India, because Gandhi did many Satyagraha campaigns, uh, he, he wanted this to be non-coercive insofar as nobody was using violence, nobody was forcing the hand of anyone. But they hoped that through their suffering, it would move that other person to willingly change their position. So this is the goal of the nonviolent satyagrahas. And so, so nonviolent resistance involves all of those uh, steps. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So we have... Uh... One more question for Dr. Sanjay Lal, sir. Uh, sir, may I ask, uh, may I read the question? Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, actually question is being asked by our principal education department, Professor K.C. Shahu. His question is how Gandhian way of empowering women is different from modern day feminism? Uh, I, I, I think uh, Gil Presby could also uh, speak on that. Uh, you know, my, my understanding is even though uh, much has been said about uh, how Gandhi's uh, attitudes toward women, many people have found to be uh, regrettable. Uh, I think uh, to, to try to give a, a brief answer to, to that question, Gandhi's way of empowering women uh, would would definitely uh, not focus on trying to make women 
more like uh, the modern day man, uh, you know, I, I think that, that that would be that would be very much a given. And, uh, you know, I, I think um, in, in modern society, uh, that this uh, assumption that human nature is is selfish and competitive, uh, it's carried over uh, in, in our attempts to uh, level the playing field. And uh, you know, for, for Gandhi, it's interesting because he he did think that uh, uh, nonviolence was closer to to the feminine nature. And you know the, the, the main thing I, I think is uh, for, for Gandhi, the difference would be that, that he wouldn't want women to become the way men have become. Uh, that, that, that would be, that would be the, the gist of my answer to that question. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Then for one more question for Gail, madam, uh, that different. What is the view of Gandhi on women empowerment? What is the view of Gandhi on women empowerment? Oh, when we're talking about empowerment, this usually means a person realizing the power that they have so that they can, um, so that they can uh, make change in the world. And this is something that Gandhi did. I mean, his movement was all about helping people to realize they have the power. And sometimes if after a long campaign, they say, oh, we never got our goal. He'd say, well, but the whole point of the campaign was actually education. It was to teach people these methods that they could organize to make changes in their lives. And so we see that there was women's empowerment. He gave in 1913, he gave women the opportunity in his movement uh, he gave them the parameters. He said, go here, do this, do this. But they took it upon themselves to fill in those parameters, to become public speakers, and to succeed in a way uh, convincing the miners to an extent that astounded Gandhi, that he, he did not even imagine they would be so successful. So that's definitely an example of women's empowerment. Uh, but women's empowerment can also come through uh, Gandhi's many ideas of development, which had a lot to do with uh, uh, village industries, which had to do with uh, create your own cooperative and sell your own agricultural produce so that the middleman doesn't get all the money and organize yourself into these uh, cooperatives and in this way uh, thrive and uh, find funds uh, for your family through these uh, cooperative uh, ventures. And the many ways in which he encouraged women, uh, campaigns to stop the drinking of alcohol was a campaign that Gandhi supported that was very much led by the women of his time and Gandhi led his support to it. So as I say, empowerment can happen in many ways. You can take political office or you can be the petitioners uh, getting the politicians to change there are many ways and he he did encourage uh, leaders and now there's always critics of Gandhi who'll say you know did he uh, did he uh, not uh, not allow women on certain occasions or were they too much his devotees and didn't develop their own ideas there, yes there can be some criticisms but there are also many ways in which he encouraged women and uh for example i've been one of my first trips to india i went to the gandhi gram rural university near madurai and we saw a lot of village industries being taught there including for women uh widows for example so uh so i know there are concrete projects on the ground that were advocated by gandhis that are continuing to this day 
thank you ma'am uh, one more question for you uh, how about thoreau's influence on gandhi with regard to satyagraha how about thoreau's influence within racket civil disobedience on gandhi with regard to satyagraha okay well definitely thoreau had some influence but i think it has to be put in context i mean first of all i mean we know and i told you that gandhi told abdur rahman you have to read this essay by thoreau on civil disobedience so gandhi was an advocate of thoreau's ideas but gandhi's ideas of satyagraha preceded his having read thoreau actually his ideas of nonviolence have more to do with um Tolstoy because he had a whole correspondence with Tolstoy prior to his reading Thoreau and there were uh nonconformists in Britain as well as the suffragists in Britain who were involved in these kinds of actions and Gandhi knew about them before he had read Thoreau so Thoreau was not the original source of his ideas um and of course there had been a uh, protest in America before Thoreau so people shouldn't think that Thoreau was always the the first but he did articulate positions very important to Gandhi remember that Thoreau never organized a mass movement like Gandhi's Thoreau what Thoreau contributed was this idea of I must act according to my conscience so I should not engage in something against my conscience and he, he also said if somebody else is being oppressed because of me i have to get off them <laughs> and stop oppressing them and then he charged the us government is oppressing people through its practice of slavery which had not been outlawed when gan when thoreau wrote and through their aggressive war against mexico so he said i cannot participate in these two things so the thing thoreau focused on is i will not do something that is wrong and he even and he held that position for a long time before he was ever arrested i think it's important to realize on the conditions under which the row was finally arrested cuz he didn't pay his taxes for a long time he spoke out against slavery uh, for a long time but he got arrested because there was a sheriff of his area and as thoreau said he was out huckleberry picking when this sheriff found him and reminded him he still owes his taxes and what did thoreau do he told the sheriff his whole theory about how it's against his conscience to support a system that does injustice and then he challenged that sheriff to quit his job and it was only after he challenged the sheriff to quit his job that he ended up getting arrested for not paying his right. taxes that was hitting a little too close to home but you can see how gandhi was also influenced by that because he goes across india telling people you don't like british colonialism quit your job and uh you know that's a very personal challenge because people really like to hold on to their jobs so that so that is something he has in common with thoreau but thoreau never started a mass movement thoreau was a naturalist a writer he was involved in local concord politics but uh, gandhi really brought innovation much further than thoreau thank you madam for your nice explanation and to, i think uh, audience is being highly satisfied with your illuminating answer now let me pick up one question for dr sanjay lal sir uh, uh, 
yes. Sir, yes. for, for the sea, for Gandhi, march to the sea. Uh, that, that too is a uh, question that I, I think uh, uh, Gail Presby could speak a lot more on, but uh, uh, my, my understanding would be that uh, the, the march above all was uh, to develop um, India's own sense of uh, uh, self-rule and, and self-reliance. Uh, uh, I mean, of course, uh, he, he was uh, protesting the, the tax on salt, but, but I think that there was a much, a much more uh, broader uh, reason. And uh, the uh, scholar Richard Soberji has uh, a very uh, uh, interesting analysis of, of the criteria Gandhi used for determining whether uh, someone was uh, motivated for, for the right reasons uh, in, in uh, participating in the Satyagraha uh, march, uh, uh, basically whether they, they were willing to consistently uh, uh, protest in a nonviolent way, and also would they continue uh, protesting even if uh, the results may not be what, what they immediately liked. And you know, I think those, those indicate uh, facets of Gandhi's overall philosophy uh, that that are are more um, uh, compelling than just the fact that there was this unjust uh, tax on salt. Uh, so uh, I, I would say to, to kind of give a short answer, uh, the march at sea was really uh, to clarify and also to develop. Um, philosophical commitments. Thank you, sir. One more question for you. Uh, yes, yes. Is Gandhi's idea of craft-centric education, is Gandhi's idea of craft-centric education is still relevant in formal education system? If it is, then how? Craft-centric education, whether it is still relevant in formal education system, if it is, then how? Okay, uh, I, I'm not sure uh, what's meant by that term, uh, the carb-centric. Crap. Oh, carb crap. Agriculture? Oh, crap. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, I think uh, as far as um, like developing uh, local uh, production and local community, uh, it is very much relevant. I mean, wh wh whether the education has to specifically focus on uh, craft making, uh, I I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, as far as uh, developing uh, ways in which members of communities can, can become more self-sufficient and, and become less reliant on uh, faraway uh, bohemian industries, uh, definitely, I would say I would say it's still it's still relevant. Uh, I mean, just uh, the whole the whole aspect of um, decentralization uh, for, for Gandhi it it can't be overemphasized, and and for him, uh, centralization is really uh, the, the basis of of so many of uh, our, our world's ills, so many of our problems. Thank you, sir. I, I could uh, add. Yeah, yeah, is yeah. It please, all right please, ma'am. Welcome. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. it's important to realize it, Gandhi, in his context, and since I've been talking about South Africa, um, Gandhi himself had his uh, education as a lawyer in England. Then he went to South Africa. He practiced as a lawyer, but he gave it all up and he moved to a rural area and started. Phoenix Settlement, Phoenix Farm. And in his works, he talked a lot about, uh, you know, it was part of his own, you could say, self-growth to give up the trappings of his material lawyer lifestyle and to be close to the earth and to work in manual labor. That was important for him 
because he had already had the lawyer's position. And it was important for his growth and also to help him connect to average people in South Africa and India. But you could say, what about the people who never had a chance to go to university and they only have the agriculture? Uh, what is Gandhi's message for them? We know that Gandhi did not want to send his own children to university. But when some scholarships became available, he did say, please give these scholarships to two young men in my community who are orphans and have no parents to pay for education. So he wasn't against higher education or university education. He just didn't want it to be uh, something that only the better uh, well-to-do could have. He wanted to engage in agriculture and wanted to send those other two boys off to university. And I think when we take a look at his, his focus on moving to a rural area and being involved in small industries, crafts, or agriculture, he had several influences. And in his own autobiography, he mentions John Ruskin, the British author, who had a whole critique of our economy and why do we pay some people more than others? And he had a critique from an egalitarian point of view of that. But he also had a nearby neighbor that very much influenced him, and that's John Dubé. Uh, John Dubé, who later became the first president of what became the African National Congress, John Dubé, as a minister in, in Anda, he started a community called Olange. And Olange was based on the Booker T. Washington ideas of self-help and self-reliance, which also focused a lot on agriculture and small industry. And what you might not know about John Dubé is that John Dubé had this community where everyone would live together and be educated together. Uh, but he also had a newspaper. And John Dubé started his newspaper on the printing press that Gandhi owned. Back when Gandhi's press was only publishing like invitations and advertisements and things like that. John Dubé published a newspaper that published in the Zulu language and had political messages, how the Zulu people will arise. And the first several issues of John Dubé's newspaper were published on Gandhi's printing press. And then John Dubé decided to buy his own press and he moved his own press to Olange in Inanda, a rural area. And he continued to publish that newspaper from Olange. It's right after that, just a few months after that, that Gandhi decides to print his own newspaper, Indian Opinion. And by the way, there was already another newspaper run by black South Africans called uh, Black Opinion. And he had Indian Opinion. He published it on his own press after Dubé had already done the same. And then he bought Phoenix Settlement directly next door to John Dubé's Olange Institute. And then he moved his press to the rural area and had a rural community both feeding itself and running that press. So John Dubé's influence on Gandhi here is very central. So to understand why Gandhi first advocated so much this idea of agriculture and small industry, it's important to know this historical background. It's also important to know about John Dubé and Olange and how these Phoenix and Tolstoy farms were so central to Gandhi's development as the person he became by the time he went back to India. Now, you could say, what does it mean for us today? Well, I would take a both and approach uh, because Gandhi wasn't against 
university, but university especially to make our world more egalitarian, not to make it more hierarchical. And yes, everyone get involved in agriculture. Everyone get involved in helping the poor in rural areas to have the uh, organizations and businesses, their own businesses so that they aren't exploited. They need to make a good living. I think it's a both and approach for Gandhi. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for your nice uh, explanation in this question. And then one statement for your comments, please. Everyone talks of Gandhi as this divine, great man who revolutionized India's freedom movement. However, most people fail to see the other side of him, not to invite controversy, but he had his misgivings too. So what will be your opinion, Madam, in this statement? Oh, definitely. We have to look at all sides of Gandhi and we have to see him in a larger context as a flawed individual. He would, he would never, you know, want to be, you're right, some people do revere him and, and, and some of that is good if you respect him and nonviolence and him to all the things he stands for. But you should never mistake him as anything more than a flawed human being which he himself would admit. His stories of experiments with truth, his autobiography is filled with his own self-castigation for his own life mistakes. But I would say it's good to have, you could say a well-rounded view because I think sometimes what happens is there's those who admire him so much they never want to hear any criticism. And then there's those who think he has so many flaws, we should stop considering him any kind of great person or role model. And those are two extremes. I, I don't think either of them is the, the best position. The best position is a realistic position in the middle that realizes his strengths and weaknesses, uh, that also sees him in historical context, that does not condemn him out of context, uh, but understanding the context, still seeing his flaws, recognizing his strengths, uh, recognizing his great contribution on a whole uh, series of issues. That's what I think would be the best way to see him. So thank you, Madam, for your uh, nice highlighting uh, on the comments. And uh, see, actually, Gandhi itself a kind of sea on which discussion cannot be uh, confined by two hours, three hours, two days, three days like that. So our chat box is ever increasing in questions. But uh, by passage of time, one point we have to come up to conclusion. And uh, we are very sorry that for the technical reasons and due to, as we have to handle three different time uh, zone, uh, perhaps that might be the reasons of Animair may not be able to join due to technical uh, side. So I am, I on behalf of the organizer, extremely sorry and sincerely apologize for you all. So with this, this, this few words and we have two glorious speakers, and we have listened and highlighted on, by and large, on Gandhi, Gandhi and his philosophy. So with this, let me come up to conclusion. And as I have been interested to offer word of thanks, so by giving word of thanks, uh, we will just uh, conclude and wrap up our today's session. So at the very outset, let me extend our deep regards and gratefulness to our three speakers starting from Dr. Sanjay Lal, Clayton State University, Professor Gail Presby, University of Detroit, Mercy, Brandy Mayer, peace activist known as American Gandhi. So they three are actually not only highlighting us, rather it's their generosity to accept our invitation only for 10 to 12 hours like that. 
and i think this is possible because of technology there's only 36 hours from our side professor asa mukherjee has taken lots of pain and give you pain too uh, every now and then mail and whatsapp and other things so it's your generosity ma'am and sir uh, dr lal and bani mehar that you are so kind to accept our invitation and enlightening our audience through your thought provoking and illustrious speech please admit our sincere gratitude and regards and we expect same support in future from you because you know education is a kind of journey not the station so our discussion our webinar our seminar will be going on and in this uh, path of journey we will get you in future course and your cooperation will be only the pathfinder in our next course of journey so thank you sir and madam uh, both of you then uh, i'd like to extend our deep gratitude to our vice chancellor professor vidyaka pradeep sir who is our perennial source of this eco eco uh, of, of this our stroke our program without his advice suggestion and monitoring this could not be possible to mature this program and of course i have no word no adjective to extend our deep sense of gratitude and uh, i don't consider her as a kind of guest and registrar and hod philosophy but by virtue of her legacy she could be one of the organizer every day and night she take care of the resource persons for the, the communication and also and also communicate me and also, and also communicate, communicate our co-host, co-host uh, in charge computer center respect to santoda so, so only because only of because our, of her uh, you know, you know some, some sort of communication and spirit we have come over here, here to offer this, offer this session, session for the, the audience, audience. So thank, so thank you, ma'am. Uh, please, uh, please accept our, our uh, gratefulness, and of course, and of course we, we expect some sort of cooperation from, from you in future course of our mission of this journey. So thank you, so thank you ma'am. And, and I'm not not forget, uh, forget to extend my distance of gratitude to Inchar Computer Center, Dr. Santosh Sankar Dasgupta, in spite of several trouble, uh, only because of the choice of resource persons we have to switch over ourselves within 24 hours from cisco webex to zoom yes it is he who made it possible to done everything from subscription to activation of these things and also designing the flyer and registration and every every technical support he has take care of this and every members of his team i would like to extend our deep gratitude on behalf of the organizer in particular and on behalf of the viswarthi in particular and of course the staff from viswarthi line network my colleague sri sujit kujur dr kaushik ghosh sri jishnu mandal and my mahadal staff who is taking care to complete this program so thank you all and last but not least without the presence of the planet audience in and out, out from isoharuti in and out from west bengal all the different parts of india only 10 hours notice we are having around 380 registration and out of which we found around 100 every time they are in the uh, board to listen our resource speaker resource persons and though last speakers we are not able to join in still last 40 minutes i am really grateful to the audience for their support and also extra grateful to gail madam and dr lal sir for taking extra pay to answering lots of questions and interacting with the uh, with the uh, audience so with these few words let us have a conclude of this session and our uh, video, video lecture of entire program will be made available in the visvardhi website and our visvardhi live network youtube channel too so all you are invited to view and subscribe our channel, channel and to know more and more, and more about, about gandhi and, and finally we like to say that as our vice chancellor saying that we are living in the pandemic days 
so please maintain physical distance but socially connected and stay safe and secure with these few words let me say good night and wrap up the uh, wrap up our session with kind permission, permission.